I had no connection. I had none whatsoever. I, in fact, I didn't even know an actor. I went up for the job uh, in London uh, on a whim because I took out an agent who, who double, uh, my friend double dated Maggie Abbott. And she was like the top agent in, in ICM. And uh, I had to meet her and she took me to a screening. And I go, oh, geez, the Rolling Stones are there and the Beatles are there. Because that's how they saw movies in those days, in screenings. They didn't have VHS or anything yet. And so uh, I took her to the movie and I didn't see the movie. I was looking at all these famous people. I'd never been that close to them. And the next thing I know, uh, I won't tell you what happened with Maggie. I went back to Paris. I went back to Paris and uh, about three weeks later, I get a phone call in a girl's flat that I've just met, and it's Maggie Abbott. And she says, Poutou. I said, how can it be? I just picked her up. I take her and picked her up at the La Capal restaurant. And so uh, Maggie had tracked her down, you know, from my friend said I went there and called the maitre d' there and said I left with this girl. He said, get your butt over to London. I think you're right for a movie they're having trouble finding someone for. And I said, Maggie, I'm not an actor. I've never spoken in front of a camera in my life. She said, it doesn't matter. You've got what they're looking for. Get your ass over to London straight away. I hung up and forgot about it because I wasn't an actor, didn't know what to do. And so uh, about three weeks later, I'm back in London with my friend who I, I took over Maggie for. And he said, what did Maggie want you for? I said, I don't know. She said, she was ringing everywhere looking for you. Let's go see her. So he took me up to her office. And her office was uh, ICM or CMA in those days. And, uh, she made Ken wait outside. He's the one who wants to be an actor. And I go in and I said, uh, how you doing? She said, good. Look, they've been having trouble. They've tested 300 guys on film and saw thousands for this role. And I think you've got what they're looking for. And I said, oh, come on, what, what's that? And uh, she said, your arrogance. <laughs> I said, my arrogance? She said, you're so sure of yourself that they can't, the guys are all shitting themselves when they test for the bond part, and it comes through. And I think you could do a test and be who you are. And an arrogant son of a gun. <laughs> I thought, uh, okay. She said, but you've got to get in by yourself. I can't get you an appointment because you're not in the union and blah, blah, blah. So I go over to the office and I uh, go in and I see all the guys dressed in suits and, and I'm in French clothes and cut like this and long sideburns and long hair and just the opposite the Bond waiter. And the girl says, no, you're not on the list. You can't come in. Go, get out of here. So I get out and I call me and I said, they won't let me in. Said, of course they won't let you in. You're not in the union. You've got to get in. Get up the stairs, go in the first door, that's Dyson Lovell, the casting guy. Let him see you. That, just let him see you. So I, oh, fuck. so I went over and I got one of Connery's suits, it was one he didn't like. And he'd left it there and it had short sleeves. I had to get the sleeves taken down. And uh, I got a haircut where he got his haircut at Kurt the Barber on, uh, uh, what was it, Redinger Drive? You know. And then uh, I went back and I waited outside the door until the girl ducked under the desk to get something and I went straight past her up the steps. <laughs> and, I, and if this hadn't happened, I was sitting on the door like this with the Rolex showing yeah. and, uh, and the guy's on the phone with Harry Salzman, Dyson Lovell, the casting guy. And he says, who are you? I said, I heard you're looking for James Bond. And he said, Harry, there's a guy here I think you should see. And Harry said, bring him over. So I went down the stairs and the girl was apologizing for letting me go up there. We get over to Harry's office and he's got his feet up on the desk, no shoes on, on the phone, pointing at the chair in front of his feet. I said, fuck that. And I went and walked over and looked out the window. 
So then he put his feet down, got off the phone, come over and started talking to me at the window. And then he said, tell me your life story. And I just told a casting guy a bunch of lies. And I couldn't remember them. So I said, <laughs> I, said uh, I just told him, let him tell you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm taking over the meeting, ordering everybody around. And Terry told me this later. He said, I was so impressed with the way you come in and so sure of yourself. I wasn't, I was shitting myself. But I was showing, I was showing myself. And then uh, he, uh, uh, well, Dyson uh, told him a full story. And then he said, when's the director coming back from Switzerland? And Dyson said, uh, three o'clock on Friday, sir. He said, you, be here at three o'clock on Friday with me. And I thought, here's another hour. I said, I can't. I, uh, I'm in Paris. What are you doing in Paris? Making a movie. How much are they paying you? I said, 500 pounds a day. That was half a year's wages in England. <laughs> and so uh, he said, go down and see Stanley Sapel. He'll give you 500 pounds. You'll be here at three o'clock on Friday. So I went down to the agent, uh, the accountant, and the accountant said, what's the 500 pound for? I said, to come back on Friday. He said, nobody gets paid to come back. What do you mean? He said, I'll give you 250. I said, no, forget about it. And he said, no, 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 come back. I'll give you the 500. He gave me the 500. Then I went out in the phone booth and called Maggie, the agent. I said, he said, how'd you do? I said, they gave me 500 pounds to come back on Friday. George, be serious. How'd you do? I said, they gave me 500 pounds to come back on Friday. She said, where is that money? I said, in my hand. Where are you? I told her, and she said, I'm coming down there. So she comes down and she couldn't, she's looking at this check, she said, I've never seen an actor get a money for a callback. <laughs> and so, yeah. No, no, I didn't think I'd get it. I thought, but I was pretending I, I was getting it. Oh yeah, and the same with the director. I had to meet the director. I came back at three o'clock on Friday and the director's sitting at his desk and he's got a little office on the other side of Harry's and he's sitting there and said, tell me your life story and he was pissed because he was gay and he had all these gay friends in Switzerland and they were going to stay there for the weekend. And Harry said, no, get your ass back here. And so he, he doesn't like me already. And so he's there going, Tell us your life story. And he's not even looked at me. He's kind of, you know, yeah. He's, he's kind of like this. <laughs> he's kind of got to get rid of this bastard look on his face. And then uh, he said, um, I said to him, I don't know what made me do it, but I came out with Peter. I haven't spoken in front of a camera in my life. And he said, what? What did you just say? I said, I've never, ever spoken in front of a camera. I've never been an actor. He said, they brought me all the way back here to see you. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know anything about acting. And he got up and he started walking around the room belly laughing. <laughs> and he was like that. And then he stopped. He said, stick to your story. I'll make you the next James Bond. And I thought, well, how are you going to do that? He says, we're going to test. Come on, let's go over and see him. So we get over there and Harry's up the stairs with Cubby. And they say, get him out of here, he's a clothes peg. Clothes peg? I never heard myself call him a clothes peg. But anyway, he said, uh, he's a male model. It would be the laughing stock of the industry. Get him out of here. And Peter said, no, I want to test him. You're not testing him at Pinewood? Uh, we'll be the laughing stock of the industry. And he said, uh, I'll do it with uh, Samuelson, the, the boss of the camera company and uh, he'll keep it quiet. And Harry said, oh, all right then. And my tests are there for four months out at the house with uh, Michael Caine was supposed to give me acting lessons and he never gave me one. We used to play table tennis and pool and shit and just have fun and uh, he was under contract to Harry at the time. And uh, then I went into the studio and I was testing with all the other actors and they didn't know I was going to be James Bond. They just thought I was an extra playing the part.
but it was teaching me and giving me experience. And then uh, United Artists said, we want to see him fight. And Harry said, he's Australian, all Australians can fight, don't worry about it. <laughs> so next thing I know, um, they got the fight team and they, they teach me how to miss with the punches, you know, and all that thing for about five minutes. And then we get into the scene and uh, they said, okay, go. And the first guy is Yuri Geller. He's a Russian wrestler. He comes running at me and I went bam with him right in the chin. <laughs> and he's on the ground with his legs kicking like this. <laughs> he's out of going. Yeah. So anyway, Harry comes over, steps over him, grabs me by the arm, takes me over to the wall. He says, we're going with you. If you keep your mouth shut, don't tell anybody. And I said, it's about time. And he said, what? I said, oh, thank you very much. Because <laughs> that's the way I used to talk. It's about time. I've been four months and all this shit. And meanwhile, uh, he said, get the hell out of the country. Uh, go hide somewhere because the press will be after you. And you talk to the press and the deal's off. Because we've got the cover of Life magazine and blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I had no problem. They had the fucking problems. They were, um, they were thinking I mightn't be able to do it. And I, um, you know, I was a natural actor. I was a salesman, car salesman. You know, and you've got a bullshit about cars that you know are going to fall apart as soon as they drive around the block. And um, I can convince them it won't. You know, it's uh, that's acting. You know, it's like. Uh, um. Well, yes, but uh, I had this guy on my heels, Ronan O'Reilly. He started Radio Caroline with all the pop groups. And so he was um, convincing me that James Bond was over. Yeah, because he's got the, uh, you know, he said Easy Rider is out and uh, Bruce Lee's movies are out and Clint Eastwood's doing westerns and He's getting 500 pounds, 500,000 pounds a movie. You can do that easy. And I went over there to Italy to do these movies and uh, they'd get a call from Harry. You use him and we'll sue you. You'll never release your movie. So I got thrown off about eight movies and I couldn't get work. And uh, eventually I got some work up in Northern Italy on a, what was it called? Who Saw Her Dying, I think. And uh, then I bought a boat and just, just sailed 15 months without uh, touching the movie industry. And that's how it happened. And then uh, I was broke back in London and I had to get some work. So I went to see Bruce Lee. 